Thank you very much. Um, so I've got 20 minutes and I've uh, I've a lot of information to impart. So uh, everybody will get a copy of the slide deck um, when I'm finished. But what I want to leave you with are really three messages. Uh, firstly, mainstream's business is all about innovative sustainability. Uh, secondly, when we talk about successful innovators, at mainstream we think about them as being open, disruptive innovators who have strong management processes. So we have a very specific definition that we use. And also, um, looking into the future, what's coming down the, down the pipe, we see sustainable cloud coming down the line, something that we are going after innovatively, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So to talk about this, I'll talk about our company vision, um, our culture, what we've done with IT, I look after IT in the company, and what I mean and what we're doing about sustainable cloud. So on our vision, the company was formed in February 2008 by Dr. Eddie O'Connor, and I think many of you know who he is. He was the founder and CEO of Airtricity, he founded that company in 1997 with 12 million pounds of seed capital, sold a decade later for two and a half million dollars. Okay, that's a change of currency, but it's a 77-fold increase in value. So mainstream is not electricity, we're not a utility. We, we develop, we, we build and we operate large scale wind and solar farms around the world. Uh, we don't sell electricity to consumers and we don't retain ownership of the assets. We work with partners to do that. So partnership is a big part of our cultural model and on our business success. So the drivers for this uh, uh, business that we're in are fourfold. Uh, firstly, climate change. You're, you're all familiar with the changes that are taking place on our planet. So um, you look at, for example, last summer we had the second biggest uh, ice melt in recorded history. Four years prior to that, um, Lewis Gordon Pugh was able to swim a kilometre at the North Pole. These are quite worrying ch uh, changes. The second big driver, of course, is exploding demand for energy. While Europe and North America are in recession, there is no recession in China nor India. Um, last year, India, uh, China added 100,000 megawatts to its electrical grid. Germany's grid is 86,000 megawatts. China added Germany to its grid last year and the year before. It'll do it this year, it'll do it next year. There are already 300 million Chinese whose average income is higher than Europeans' average. There are 300 million Chinese richer than us, right? So China is, um, is exploding in its, in its demand and its impact. So as the West comes out of recession, <coughs> energy is going to, be, going to be a big challenge for all of us. And that's contributing to a, to a rising fuel price, fossil fuel price. Um, in 1997, oil was $9 a barrel, a decade later, $147 a barrel. That's a 16-fold increase in price. Your mind refuses to allow you to imagine a 16-fold increase in price over the next decade. It's, not a, it's a thought that your mind says, illegal, do not process. But um, Richard Branson has looked at it, and so has the US military, and they're now taking uh, steps to address that, that threat that they see coming. The fourth threat, which is particular to Europe, is that uh, while we have a very good natural gas distribution system from Russia, we are running out of fossil fuel within our region. We lack the sophisticated electrical distribution that Europe would need for renewable energy. And uh, if we do nothing, if we select option A, we become dangerously dependent on Russia by 2030. And the European Commission has taken steps to, to address that by imposing upon all utilities the need for renewable energy at large scale. So crisis, what crisis? Well, it's interesting that in China, when they, when, when they talk about crisis, they talk about danger and opportunity. So you think about the, the, the danger that we feel as a country right now with our big debts and our, you know, our, our stalled in the water Celtic tiger. Uh, there are opportunities all around us, um, but, but the, you, know, you have to look at them slightly differently. This is the, again, this is the open, disruptive, innovative mind that I, that I talked about. So our business model, we, uh, we work with governments around the world in eight different countries. As I said before, we develop, we construct, and we operate large-scale assets. We currently have 14,000 megawatts of projects underway around the globe. Um, in Europe, our projects are all large-scale offshore wind, which is a, a disruptive <coughs> technology, a disruptive market. Um, outside of Europe, our projects are onshore wind and onshore solar in South Africa, Chile, US, and Canada. And to put it into perspective, Ireland's uh, electrical demand <coughs> peaks at the equivalent of 5,000 megawatts uh, in the summer, so you can, or in the winter rather, and so you can see that we're already uh, closing in on three times Ireland's uh, capacity with our own projects after four years. Uh, when you look at the world from the big picture perspective on energy, Dr. Mark Delucci uh, has written a very interesting report on this showing that there is no technological barrier 
to a world right now that's completely 100% uh, uh, sustainable through wind, hydro and solar. The barriers are political uh, and social primarily. Um, right now, a quarter of the world's wind power is in China, a country which had no wind power a decade ago. There's already 200, 230,000 megawatts uh, of wind power installed uh, around the globe. So you look at the four big countries. Spain uh, unusually has a huge amount of wind on its grid. So this, this is the world that we're in. The, the world that we're in um, is changing very, very fast when it comes to energy. Um, we see a world that by 2050, uh, Europe will have no choice but to be 100% sustainable. So for this to happen, it's, it's, it's all about large-scale offshore wind, and for that to happen, Europe will be investing in the region of 6.4 trillion euros in this technology. You may say, well, that's a phenomenal amount of money. Think of option A, do nothing. Do nothing equates to 2 trillion euros of natural gas imports from Russia uh, instead of the capital investment uh, in, into something which has a free fuel. Uh, the key enabler for all of this is, is Supergrid, and we've been working uh, on several innovations for Supergrid. In fact, we're working with 23 companies on this. So we formed an open innovation alliance with 23 organizations, including Intel and General Electric and Siemens, some of the names you mightn't recognize. But this is where we're, we're seeking to work uh, to ensure that the European Commission's broad policy turns into uh, tactical reality and therefore business opportunities for everybody involved. Um, we think that better IT is a key part of this. Um, we simply need to build these wind farms faster, better, and cheaper. And right, right the way around the activities in the, in the construction of these large offshore wind farms, uh, innovation is needed. And we're, we're going after at least six innovation trajectories under IT, working with those uh, 23 companies. So just to talk about our innovation culture for a moment, um, in terms of definition, I like, the de I, I like increasingly Wikipedia's definition for everything, you know. I, um, it's amazing how, you know, we talk about open sharing of information, you know, open sharing of definitions. Of course, you have to treat what you see in Wikipedia with, 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 with a health warning, but, you know, innovation as the creation of better products, processes, services, or ideas that are then readily available to society, as distinct from invention, which is the creation of the new idea or an improvement, you know, make doing, this, doing the current thing slightly better. So if you think then about good examples of innovation, think about how Dell get their money. D Dell gets you to pay them about 90 days before uh, they have to pay their suppliers. Um, think about how um, Intel are phenomenally good at, at increasing their, their, um, the power of, of their chipset, Moore's Law, you know, a phenomenal relentless machine. Think about how Virgin Atlantic on customer intimacy have, have created a niche uh, and, and high value. Think about how Lexus took on uh, Mercedes, uh, for, you know, Toyota created a brand there. And then think about how GE Capital relentlessly modify how they run their business, you know, Six Sigma as, as, a, as a framework within all of GE. Uh, but then open innovation, you know, which is the key obviously for today's discussion, the, the definition from Professor Henry uh, Chesborough, but it, it, you know, the concept that there's an open funnel, that there's peripheral vision, that you're not just, uh, uh, you know, relentlessly following uh, a linear thought process, but you're laterally thinking, but then how you are linking in along the way with other firms um, who are customers or partners and customers or, you know, uh, vendors and customers at the same time. So uh, the, the whole key here, of course, is that we talk about the virtuous helix. This is what uh, Professor Martin Curley talks about as the virtuous helix from, from, from Intel in, and also co-director of the Innovation Value Institute public, private, and academic a partnership. So what we're finding is that as we reach the limits of current thinking, we can't progress as a commercial organization without connecting into academia, without connecting into public bodies, uh, and indeed without connecting into other private organizations. But then you talk about disruptive innovation. Well, th this is a photograph of the very first wind farm in Ireland, Bellacarrick, County Mayo, built when uh, Dr. Lee O'Connor was the CEO of Board Namona. They said it couldn't be done. Now we've wind farms all over Ireland and indeed all over Europe. This is a photograph of Arclo Bank, built by Dr. Eddie O'Connor when he was CEO of um, Electricity, first offshore wind farm in Europe. Again, people said it couldn't be done. Now we have large-scale offshore wind farms right across Europe and, and increasingly across the globe. But for this to happen, we're talking about disruptive innovation. These were very disruptive innovations at the time. Um, you know, you know, a disruptive innovation creates a new market 
and eventually disrupts an existing market, displacing an earlier technology. So <coughs> renewable energy is now, <coughs> it's now here for real. It's, it's no longer uh, in its early phase. So it has, it has actually disrupted the fossil fuel market in many parts of the world. But to do that, you're talking about high risk, high reward. So creating a new market and radical technology change, that's the high risk, high reward space. Now, you know, your strategy in your business can be in any of these you know, four, four boxes if you, if you measure uh, your, 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 your strategy on innovation. But the most exciting place is always high risk, high reward. Um, but, but then, of course, you have to think about the, um, the, the chasm. You know, it's all very well having a great vision, but uh, to get into growth and profits, you have, a, you have that chasm to jump. And this is from uh, Jeffrey Moore's book, Crossing the Chasm. You know, how do you do this? I mean, this is, this is the big challenge. You've great, you know, you've great ideas, uh, you've got a great team, you've got everything lined up, but how are you going to do that? And there are many ways to look at it. What we look at in mainstream is we look at it as having three ingredients. The first one is the virtuous helix we've already talked about. Now, if you look across Europe, and the European Commission look at this all the time, there's something different happening in Finland, okay? Now, the, 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 you know, the, there's a very elaborate mechanism to measure innovation at the Commission. Um, it's a, fair, it's, a, it's a credible model that they've been using now for many years. But in the top four, Finland bounces around always within that top bunch in green, Innov innovative leaders, as opposed to modest innovators at the far end. Very nice way of saying, you know, the opposite of innovation leadership, right? But Ireland, Ireland is, Ireland is here. So Ireland is just near the average, right? Just behind uh, Lithuania, okay? Finland is up here with, with Germany, Denmark, Sweden, but it's been, the year before it was up at number one. So um, you, you say, well, what's, what's, what's different about these? And uh, the analysis at the commission is that uh, um, there's a higher than average score in public, private, co-publication. There's, there's a higher than average incidence of the virtuous helix in, the, in those four countries, in, in Finland in particular. Finland had to reinvent itself after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Finland was the gateway in and out of the Soviet Union and their economy utterly collapsed in 1989. They reinvented uh, themselves. And what they did was they created an integrated education system, which is now called the Finland phenomenon. Education is, is looked upon from the very early days of, of childhood right the way through to, to PhD and beyond. And it's free. It's entirely free. Um, in, in the OECD league table on science, Finland, number one. Always number one. So Finland is not an accidental success. You know? We can learn from Finland. The second ingredient is the right people. So, uh, the, the, you know, the concept that innovators are different. They're not, they're not uh, ordinary. Um, and uh, we talk about left brain, right brain, uh, empathy and uh, emotional intelligence and logic and rationality, etc. But um, a recent article in the Harvard Business Review shows that, uh, you know, perhaps one way of looking at it is that there are five traits of the innovator. The, 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 the open disruptive innovator is very good at, at, at associational thinking, always questioning, observing, uh, idea networking, and experimenting. Now, these are traits that we can all develop. We're all, we all actually have all these traits. That's, that's our species developed these traits over uh, a million years ago. And uh, as, as, as our current uh, form evolved, we needed these to, to develop and survive, right? But um, if you think about um, success and failure, often innovation begins with you know, hard look, a hard look at these things. You know, are, are you looking at uh, associational thinking enough, for example, when, when, you, when you develop your innovation ideas? Some people are very, very good at it, right? Obviously, um, Steve Jobs had mentioned earlier. Um, so in your organization, you need the right people on the bus. You need, you need to have the, the, the open, disruptive innovators. Um, when you think about our education, you, we often talk about disruptive students. You can remember in your own education, the guy in the class who, well, maybe you were one of them, the disruptive guy. They're the guys in Finland that they want. They're the guys they help. They're the guys they encourage. We probably need to think about that in our education system. So the course of history is set by the unreasonable man. That's a quote from an, Irish, an Irishman, actually. Um, the third ingredient, then, is a culture of innovation. It's all very well having you know, the virtuous helix and the right people. But if you don't have a systematic way of capturing that, developing that, um, it, it can unfortunately be lost. You know, the, the iPhone is not an accidental product. It's an excellent product from an excellent company. But um, there's a discipline of innovation that happens in Apple. So high innovation, high discipline, rather than 
The other three uh, uh, were, you know, startup, many, many startups, very, very innovative. They lack the discipline. They never get off the ground, as, as Jim Collins would, would say, you know, they don't become great organizations. Hierarchical organizations, low in innovation, low in discipline. Bureaucracy then, you know, a form for everything, you know, red tape and circular, whatever, you know, no innovation either. So you have to think about this as well in your organization. Avoid, you know, I suppose, uh, think about uh, avoiding the trap of not falling, of not getting into that high innovation, high discipline box. You know, be careful about that. Um, when you look then at, at culture, um, you can only measure behaviors, but what's driving behaviors? Values drive behaviors, but you can't see the values that a person has. You can sometimes detect their beliefs and assumptions. You'll, you'll, you'll see their behavior. And then you say, well, what, what are we talking about when we say culture? Well, culture is the way we do things around here, but you can, you can actually assess innovative culture in an organization. Uh, the Innovation Value Institute have developed a very interesting uh, mechanism for doing that. Now, it's, it's as objective as the subjective inputs, right? But it's a good way to get the debate going in your own culture, in your own company, on strategy, uh, on, on, uh, on the people and on the processes. How, how are you with innovation? How, how, are, how are these things actually happening in your, in your company? And, um, you know, when we look at it when in our own company, we're very clear on this, that, you know, we, we make sure that we, we measure this um, with our people. So within our company values, innovation is right there alongside teamwork and sustainability and safety and customer service and an entrepreneurial uh, approach. But uh, it's also important that, um, you know, the, not, not only are you measuring uh, your, your innovative culture, but that you have disciplines in place, looking at, rigorously looking at, you know, product leadership, operation excellence and customer intimacy as you develop your innovations, as you characterize them. And then as you crank through the process that you're very deliberately looking at uh, a mechanism, you know, this is, this is uh, uh, Drucker's method, you don't have, you know, but what I would suggest is have a method, you know, it's like when you learn to play chess, always have a plan, right? It doesn't have to be a great plan, but always have a plan. Um, so the, the, the innovation management discipline, that's what differentiates winners from losers. If you look at Apple, Apple are extraordinarily good at this sort of stuff. Um, but also leadership. You need leadership. You need to make sure that the, the people in your organization are, are, are clear on what it is that you expect from them uh, in the context of, of uh, innovative leadership. The vision, uh, you know, executing purposely with a plan, measuring and, uh, and rewarding uh, innovation. And then you look at, uh, you know, some inspiration. What are the kinds of things that might inspire? Well, this, this is actually Martin Curley's book. I know I'm kind of stealing a bit of his thunder, but that's his book anyway. <laughs> Managing IT, Innovation for Business Value. The fascinating book here, Blue Ocean Strategy, the premise of this book is that the way to deal with competition is make them irrelevant. Um, instead of opening up a new uh, airline route between Dublin and London, why not open up one between Dublin and, you know, um, Beijing, you know? Uh, good to great, Jim Collins, I've, I've alluded to a couple of times. Um, the fifth discipline on, on the learning organization, crossing the chasm, that's referenced earlier, about you know, ha the methods that, that Jeffrey Moore recommends. And of course, the, the, the godfather, or the grandfather of the whole game, Peter Drucker, Innovation Entrepreneurship, his, his seminal book on, on the topic. So just talking about our own innovation in, in uh, mainstream in IT, so rather than you know, taking Many examples, just to narrow, narrow in on, on our IT innovation. Um, it's funny how, you know, when you try to look into the future, what you see. So this is, I, I've never been able to tell, is this actually true or false? But it's presented as true. Maybe someone in the room can tell me that it's actually fiction. But apparently, the Rand Corporation in 19, 1950s tried to look at what the home PC would look like in 2004. <laughs> so this dude here, I'm not sure what the, dial, what the big wheel is for. I don't know. And this is... <laughs> And then you've got the kind of TV up here, and you've got all these dials and voltmeters and ammeters and everything just to tell you, I suppose. I don't know. But um, it's very difficult to look into the future. I mean, it isn't easy, right? But there are, there are certain things that you can, you can look at. But for, from the perspective of um, IT innovation, uh, again, at the Institute, the definition used is, is, is to talk about a tension between the wow and the now. So at, 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 its, at its largest level, you're talking about the invention end of the continuum. And at the bottom, you're talking about you know, acute problem solving. So what they've tried to do is synthesize all of this together into a coherent model that you can use. Because you're often not sure what your idea is. You know? So rather than trap yourself in a, in a kind of a mind game, to sort of think about it, well, you know, let, let's, let's look at a mechanism and at a process there. So um, the now, incremental improvements have to happen today and tomorrow. 
uh, the big the big changes you know um, have to happen but they're part of maybe a five-year or three-year strategic plan so in terms of our own context then for, from an IT innovation perspective you know just to reiterate that you know we're exclusively in renewable energy we're, we're a new company we're growing fast we operate um, out of 11 offices now in eight countries and what we need obviously um, is uh, secure and accessible IT services to enable our business. So the first thing we did, we, we laid out um, a vision that we would have all these uh, services and systems highly integrated because what we wanted was a single version of the truth. We wanted faster decision making and efficient workflow. So people often talk in IT about legacy systems, you know, and the, the horror of legacy, right? But, but, you know, you have to wonder, how did we ever end up with legacy? Who, who, who gave us this terrible, terrible thing called legacy, you know? So how do you avoid legacy, right? Well, um, that was all in our minds as well when we were setting up the company. We didn't want to build legacy. We wanted to build something that was adding value, but was, fut if you like, future-proof. So what we, what we have is what we, what we essentially have a, a, a secure private cloud. And that's the second thing, execution, you know, delivering results. We had to deliver results in 2008 and, and all the way through till now, but also conscious that by 2014, we're going to be a huge company. So we've actually partnered very, very tightly with Microsoft. We use 32 Microsoft products, in fact, 33. We now use the, the Lumia for our, we don't use iPhones, we use the Nokia Lumia. And we, we work with uh, Microsoft's smart energy reference architecture. So that, that's, that's what we did. Now, you know, that's an innovation. Um, people often talk about best of breed and, you know, whatever works for you, I suppose. But uh, we, we took a very principled approach about how we wanted to do IT. And also then, um, on innovation, the control. So we have a very structured toll gate process. This is, a, this is actually the mechanism um, that GE widely use. So the, the theory is that all the great ideas for IT projects are an open-ended funnel. But you, don't, you, you want to fail fast and early the bad ideas. But you also want to identify and track fast the good ideas. So you, so you want to have an open funnel here. But as you go along, you don't want the wrong things distracting the organization of the IT department. So it's all, you know, having a strong um, governance and council is key to the, to the, uh, to, to the whole innovation uh, journey. Um, for example, you know, uh, just taking that continuum thing, I mean, you know, th these are some examples of what we've done, you know, <coughs> being consistent with our company values on sustainability, as well as being conscious of the need for service. Um, and then looking out towards 2015, we're working on four major, four major open innovation projects. The integrated C information system mentioned at the top, that's, a, that's a, um, an innovation with 18 organizations from across Europe to develop a better way to manage project risk for offshore wind farms. So just on sustainable cloud, um, you know, we always worry that we miss the next big thing. I mean, what if, what if we're the last person in town to get one of these? You know, you don't want to be, you don't want to feel silly and be the last person to get one, do you? You want to be up to the minute with the latest thing, right? Well, um, there are major, I think there are very significant trends now hitting in IT. One of them is that um, we're seeing the democratization of IT. You know, uh, Facebook got rid of Mubra, right? Uh, we're seeing that happen. So, uh, you know, people power, uh, you know, crowds making decisions, but also instant access to information, uh, good or bad, accurate or inaccurate. But it is changing, changing the game. And uh, Intel estimate that by, indeed, by 2015, there would be 15 billion microprocessors in use uh, across, across the world. And that by 2020, you know, five billion people will be, will be online. I mean, this is a phenomenal uh, leap forward. This is the world we're in. So the, wor the world we're in is, you know, when you think about 2015 or 2020, it's radically different to 2012. So we're not, we're not developing our innovations in our organizations in a static universe. You know, the world is changing very fast. Energy increasingly dominates the IT debate. In a decade, it's gone from being an irrelevant uh, cost to a major cost. And this is driving a lot of decisions around IT uh, in, in organizations. Uh, the Internet of Everything, I mean, I mentioned the 15 billion microprocessors, but 80% um, of those would be machine-to-machine -machine communicating, you know, pervasive, uh, pervasive uh, IT. And then cloud computing is ready. I mean, cloud computing, which was seen, you know, as, as maybe a bit of a fad or a rebranding of web services or, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's happening for real now. The, 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 the industry is switching to it. It is now something you can really use in your business to enable you. But uh, if you look then at Gartner's hype cycle, I mean, this is a very interesting way to analyze 
where are we with all these, with, with, with any particular technology. But on the hype cycle for cloud, um, in terms of where are the things that are now delivering productivity, well, service-oriented architecture for the, for the IT people in the room, that is now seen to be uh, delivering value. The technology trigger, some of the things that are happening in cloud are very, very early phase. You'll see them mentioned in the media. So what happens is, you know, take, take any technology, take the automobile, you know, uh, Mr. Benz invents the car and we're all excited, we go mad with it, and then we realize, wow, this, I, could, I, could, I could drive to Vienna or Beijing on it, and then you realize, shit, I need to get oil and I need to get tires. So you get very disillusioned about the maintenance, <laughs> and then you slowly kind of call it and say, okay, well, maybe I should have bought the maintenance pack and maybe I should have listened to the guy in the garage. And then finally, okay, I don't crash as much and I'm, I'm happy with my car, right? So similarly with cloud, you have to be realistic about what's coming here, you know. But equally for your own product or service, your customer is going to get wildly excited and then maybe get disillusioned. So you have to be ready for the long haul here, you know. So I think it's a very useful thing to think about with your, with your open innovation uh, thinking. Um, leave you on the thought of uh, sustainable cloud. So cloud computing, just for those who, who uh, aren't clear on the definition, um, the delivery of computing as a service rather than as a product uh, with, you know, shared resources, you know, the software information is provided uh, over the internet, as opposed to you having to have your own hardware, your own, your own uh, in-house uh, things. And then sustainability, uh, the capacity to endure. You know, we're at that point now where we're past peak oil, peak coal, peak gas. We know the impact of fossil fuels on the carbon dioxide content in our atmosphere. So we're at the end of the fossil fuel era. We're coming into the era of sustainable energy, which was always there for us and is technologically available, but, you know, we're at the point of that happening. So then you think about, well, what about sustainable cloud computing? That essentially um, consumers will probably only want to deal with uh, cloud providers who are sustainable. Corporations who outsource their services or transition them don't want to inherit a problem by dealing with a third party that has a problem with, with sustainability. So therefore the concept of sustainable cloud seems to be um, emerging. Um, in terms of its features, we, we look upon this in, in mainstream, that this is, a, this is a source of opportunity for Ireland that if you look at it in its full solution stack, there's a technology layer, but there's also a very real aspect around the building, the energy use and distribution. So the, we're working with, with NUI Maynooth and Intel and others on this to look at how we could maybe get Ireland uh, first mover advantage in sustainable cloud. Um, the other key thing, of course, is that uh, the right attitude helps with, uh, with open innovation. Henry Ford, you know, whether you think you can do something or oh, you think you can't, you're right. Your mind, your perspective determines everything. And of course, don't forget vision, you know. Uh, you know, September 12, 1962, you know, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept and we are unwilling to postpone and one which we intend to win. So, in conclusion, Innovation, innovative sustainability is what mainstream business is all about. Successful innovators are open, disruptive innovators with strong management processes, and sustainable cloud is on the way. Thank you. Thank you, John. I found that very interesting. Can I just ask, uh, I'm going to open it to the floor for questions, but uh, can I just ask, obviously you've set up um, the company and very much thinking how you're going to sustain innovation going forward. But what can older organisations do like um, is to ramp up innovation? People who already have structures in place, place even some of those yep. bureaucratic organisations. Sure. Like. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think um, I think it's a case of you know making innovation uh, a part of the organisation's goals rather than an adjunct. I think that's the important thing. And to connect innovation with the uh, with the vision for the organisation, with the mission of the organisation, and with the particular goals for the next calendar year, and then to make sure that uh, you know HR are fully tuned into this, so that in the in the appraisal process, in the recruitment process, and you know in, in hiring and developing people, that innovation is in there the whole way through. And I think that um, it does come from initially from very strong executive sponsorship. You know, the fish rots from the head, you know, as, as they say, right? So the leader has to be, you know, on, on, on point with this. So whoever the leader is has to be the sponsor and the driver and the exemplar for innovative thinking. So you think of Steve Jobs, you know, that's, that's the kind of role model that in any organization, public, private, academic, that I think we need. Okay. Well, have any questions?
questions from the floor? Would you like to? Sorry, there we go. Thanks for a great presentation. Quick question around, I suppose, policy innovation. The business you're in, you need different countries for their policies yeah. to shift towards adopting. Yeah. Uh, so what have you, have you seen different countries and processes that they put in yeah. for the policy side? Definitely. Um, you know, generally, uh, Scandinavia is phenomenally successful in that regard. They're very, they're very the, the, the way they go about policy, it's very process-centric. It's end-to-end. -end. It's constantly being refined. And there's also a very interesting competitive tension between Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark. As, as I visited them, you notice they do things slightly different, but you can see they're, they're all trying to be that bit more innovative with, with their public uh, policy and their, and, their, and, their, and their public services. Um, around the world, some countries have had to learn very fast, South Africa and Chile in particular. So they've had to look across the world. So South Africa, for example, set out three years ago to radically expand its energy portfolio to double it from 40,000 megawatts to 80,000 and to bring in large-scale renewable energy. So they looked across the globe and they brought in experts to help them benchmark what are the best countries doing. And then that was the process that they used and the policy was informed by that. Um, so rather than try to invent it at home, uh, you know, they went out and looked. They benchmarked okay, who's doing this very, very well, Scandinavians in particular. Similarly, Chile they, they followed a similar exercise. They looked across the globe. They didn't just copy their next door neighbor, nor did they just invent it at home. They, they looked, at, looked out and about. So peripheral vision, I think, is very important for policy innovation. Thank you. Hello. Um, I liked your, your diagram, the cloud, the energy cloud at the end. How does distributed power generation fit into that? So, you know, the next level of, you know, where power is generated at source, like at the home or at the yeah. factory or, you know. Well, I think, well, there's a couple of things. Um, when you look at the economics of sustainable energy, um, large-scale wind, large-scale solar has a low cost per kilowatt hour. If you put the, the assets lo very localized on you know, a little wind turbine on the roof of your house, the cost per kilowatt hour is very high by comparison. So really, the, 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 way, the way forward for Ireland and for Europe is, la is large-scale. That's, that's, that's the first thing. And, and then secondly, the way the energy is transferred requires a new electrical grid. So while you know, there's a very sophisticated natural gas grid around Europe, there is no sophisticated electrical grid. So the super grid consortium that I mentioned, 23 companies are now part of, that's to create a new high voltage DC energy backbone for Europe. So Ireland, um, our, our CEO, Dr. Connor, launched three weeks ago the Energy Bridge project. We're going to build 5,000 megawatts of onshore wind in the Midlands of Ireland and directly connect that into the Midlands of, of Britain. Britain has a serious need for uh, renewable energy over the next uh, decade, and we see this huge opportunity. 